Thing. Order! Oh, order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And with us here tonight, the Conservative Transport Secretary, the man who ran Theresa May's campaign to become Tory leader, Chris Grayling. The Labour MP, Lisa Nandy. The President of the Liberal Democrats, Sal Brinton. The Chief Executive of the High Street Shop Next, Simon Wolfson. And probably the only vicar to have had a number one single, and who was last seen in the Paso Doble on Strictly, Richard Coles. And if you want to engage in the debate that goes on, our hashtag is BBCQT. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, or you can text 83981 and push the red button if you want to see what others are saying. And only civilised debate, please, not just raw insult, which seems to be the current mode. Our first question is from Susan Clark, please. Let's have her question. Uh, in the light of the Harvey Weinstein scandal, is sexism, sexism just as prevalent as it was in the 60s and 70s? Is sexism just as prevalent today as it was in the 60s and 70s? Sal Brinton. Uh, yes, I, th I think it is, and I'm not surprised by the revelations. I think many women uh, from my generation in the 70s, right the way through, had to learn to put up with it because that is what we were told to do and we were ignored if we made complaints. The really positive thing to come out of the dreadful revelations about Harvey Einstein has been the hashtag Me Too, because now we all know that it's everywhere and it's not just the occasional woman's fault for being too attractive or um, somebody just trying to make a pass. Just um, explain Me Too, the hashtag. The hashtag Me Too um, started earlier in the week where, um, and I can't remember the name of the actor in America, said, if you have, ha have faced harassment of any sort or worse, just do hashtag me too. I was surprised to discover my young daughter had done that hashtag herself on Twitter. I did not know, um, but in common with many other young women, she has got on with her life. The question for us as a society is, is it acceptable? And the answer is no. And I think finally, the wider community is understanding that we need to call things out like this when we see them and support women and men, because it affects men too, when it happens. Richard Coles. I thought Me Too was brilliant because it revealed something that perhaps we didn't fully know yet, or not all of us fully know yet, which is the sheer extent of that kind of behaviour of men towards women, which is shocking and deplorable. I think one of the things that depressed me most of all about it was just how persistent that behaviour has been in certain places, particularly places where individuals have um, extraordinary degrees of power, like a film producer. In the music industry too, Tom Jones spoke about it earlier, didn't he? Having had a similar experience when he was starting out. I think what I find depressing about it is uh, just how slow some men have been to learn the lessons of feminism. Decades of feminism now. How slow men are to respect women properly and also to respect themselves properly. One of the things that I find most striking about this is the extent to which those who... Uh, perpetrate this kind of behaviour, seem to have so little sense of themselves as, as full human beings, so little self-respect. And I think that's something that men need to do, is to try to understand better why we behave in that sort of way, we in the, in the most general sense, and to talk a little bit about what male identity means, because that's got rather left behind, I think, because so much of the running has been made um, about questions around women's identity. So we've got a lot of catching up to do, I think. Um, what about in your trade? Simon Wolfson, in, we talked about um, show business and theatre and all that. What about in industry and on the shop floor? I, I think what you'll find is that the more women there are in an industry, the less sexism there is. Um, and you know, certainly I'm in an industry that has you know, huge numbers of, of female employees. Um, and I have never come across anything in the workplace. I've never come across an HR case or anything coming close to... Um, what Harvey Weinstein has, has done. So 
I think whilst it's incredibly important that we um, are very careful about how we behave in the workplace and understand, people understand um, how you can abuse power. And one a good example of that, I think, is swearing. I, I think particularly using sexual swear words in the workplace is, is threatening for some people, particularly women. And th it's that sort of behaviour, I think, that we need to make sure doesn't creep into our, our businesses and make sure that we are respectful. I'd like to hear from any members of the audience. Yes, a, a person in the second row from the back there. Yes, you. As a transgender person, I also say me too. Within 100 feet of this, where we're very sitting now, I was physically attacked by a bunch of males. I've been in a hate crime conference with Bedfordshire Police today as a guest speaker um, because of that. Um, and I've turned that negative into a positive. And picking up what you were saying about the workplace, on the other hand, I work for Monarch Aircraft Engineering, part of the former Monarch Group. And we'll get to that in a minute, Chris, <laughs> I'm sure. No, no, you can stick to the point. <laughs> but um, Can't slip I work for them. And in my workplace, I'm well respected uh, all over the world. I teach people from all over the world, and I'm well respected. I think i quite with the Me Too, and I think many people should go with it also. But, OK, and the question is whether sexism is as prevalent as it was in the 60s and 70s. What do you think? Well, you probably weren't around in the 60s and 70s at the wasn't, back then. But I do think it is still a sexist today. Even on the way from the car park to here tonight, we had a man shout out of his car window saying things to us, and that's literally because my sister was wearing a skirt. Um, it doesn't go away, but I do think that now people in the industries, like fam famous people, are speaking out and saying these things are happening to them, and people are getting their comeuppance, like Harvey Weinstein. Hopefully it will seep down into general society and people will learn that it's actually not okay and I agree with Reverend Richard Coles saying how can that man who said that to me and my sister look at us as a human being like what is he thinking saying that to a young woman and you know we feel scared like walking through a park at night there's three men sitting on a bench you don't know if they're gonna say something to you it is actually really scary it's, it's not okay Lisa Nandy and sort of a bit tempted to say what she said actually <laughs> and just leave it at that but because I wasn't around in the 60s and 70s either but I don't know a single woman who hasn't been sexually harassed at some point in their lifetime or worse sexually assaulted so I don't know how bad it was before but it's certainly very very bad now and I I agree with Sal and with other people on the panel who said that they've been very inspired by the solidarity shown by women coming out with the hashtag me too and talking about their experiences but the truth is that it's 2017 and we shouldn't be talking about this, we should be acting on it. And actually, wherever I go in my day job, in politics or in my life generally, what I see in these closed rooms is men in positions of power and women who don't hold that power. And until we start to think seriously about how we change that, more diversity in these organisations, much more transparency, so you don't get these examples, like the FA this week, of institutions investigating themselves behind closed doors and then publishing the outcome. Unless we start to take that seriously and act, instead of just talking about it, I fear that when my son grows up, we'll still be having this conversation then. But, but did, yeah, do you... The, the interesting thing is, has the Harvey Weinstein scandal actually brought out things and will it change the mood? I mean, the hashtag me too, is that, is that are people already reconsidering their attitude, men to women in particular? Well, I, I, actually, I, I think one of the most disturbing things about this is that when there was this outpouring of, uh, you know, sort of collective... Uh, it felt like therapy, really, for a lot of women, I think, just being able to talk about these things openly using that hashtag, there was a response from a significant minority of men, particularly on social media, that sought to blame the victim. The response to Emma Thompson, for example, was, why didn't you do anything about it? Why didn't you speak out earlier? And until we stop blaming the victims, I think we're going to be in a very bad place indeed. The person over there in the check shirt, yes. Uh, I was around in the 60s and 70s. 
And yes, sexism was um, prevalent and it is just as prevalent, if not more so now, I believe. Um, I was sexually harassed, I was groped. You know, wh where, wh what are we actually mean here? We've now got um, what's come up with, with uh, what we've heard in the, in the media this week and the last couple of weeks with a powerful film producer, you know, Hollywood and everything else. It's all becoming um, so big and I'm, I'm so pleased it is, it needs to be. Um, but we do have to be careful that it also does not become a witch hunt and people do not just jump on bandwagons for the sake of it. We had no voice in the 60s and 70s to actually speak out. We were afraid then as well. Um, and what we have to also be careful, I, 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 you know, the hashtag, that is wonderful, but we also have to be very careful that it doesn't become much, much, much bigger and people become victims of that too. Okay. The man with spectacles there. In the, in the, yes, you. Hi. Um, the case of institutional sexism is a strange one. I think it's still prevalent now. Um, question, suppose Simon's probably the best one to answer this. A friend of mine a few years ago was approached by Abercrombie & Fitch or Hollister, the brand. Um, they get recruit women to work in their shops purely based on their appearance. They just walked up to her in the street and said, do you do any modelling? Do, do you want a job? Um, regardless of our credentials. How do you remove that as a, an embedded policy like that from, from a huge company? Chris, I'll come to you, but do you want to briefly answer that, Simon? Um, yeah, well, it certainly doesn't exist in my company. Otherwise, I would never have got a job as a sales assistant, I'm pleased to say. <laughs> OK. Chris Grayling. So I think the thing that is different today is the horrendous things we've seen us over the last few weeks, the revelations, would not have happened, I think, 20 or 30 years ago. Our society is a more open place, it's more willing to face up to these things, it's more willing to condemn, and there is therefore the opportunity to change. Uh, if you go back to the 60s and 70s, and I was a, a child in the 60s and a teenager in the 70s, the reality is, as we've heard so often from the victims, they did not speak out because nobody would have believed them and nobody would have done anything about it. It's different today, and that has to be the positive. Okay. okay. Let's... Um, we go on, so we've got, we've got a number of questions to get through before we take the next question. As always, I'll just say where we're going to be next week, which is Portsmouth, and the week after that in Kilmarnock. Make a note if you want to come either to Portsmouth or Kilmarnock. The details are on the screen. I'll give them again at the end. Let's have a question from David McNess, please. How would the panel survive with no income and no savings and a six-week wait for state support? Uh, right, that's of course. <laughs> a reference to the introduction of universal credit, which has been very much in the news and being talked about in Parliament. Um, Simon Wolfson, how would you survive with no income, no savings, and a six week wait for state support? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't imagine how difficult that would be. Um, and. I think whilst universal credit in principle is a, is a great idea, the idea that you go to one place, that you don't have to fill out millions of forms in millions of different places, simplifying the whole process is completely the right policy. But this idea that people have got to wait six weeks to get paid must be wrong. And the reason it's wrong is because what does it cost the government to pay people, rather than pay people in arrears, what would it cost the government to pay them in advance? And the answer is, well, they'd have to borrow a month, that, that month of money. Now, the person, the body that can borrow by far the cheapest in this country is the government. It can borrow at less than a quarter of a percent on overnight money. Those people who are, who are in that position, they will have to go to the very, very most expensive um, lenders. They will be borrowing at rates of 40, 50 percent. So it is insane for the government not to be the borrower rather than the receiver of benefits. Well. And, he's a, and he's, a, he's a Conservative supporter and a Conservative funder. What do you say to him? I mean, let alone all the people who are having difficulty with universal. So let's funding. explain what the universal credit's designed to do. He's it's explained that. OK. He just okay. says you could borrow the money and get out of the problem. No, well, let me explain what it's designed to do. It's designed to enable people to move into sometimes part-time work, moving on to full-time work, to have a change of circumstance where when they're in the system, they don't have to keep logging back in, logging back on, reclaiming. It's also designed to end the situation where uh, somebody's working part-time, 16 hours a week. Yeah, uh, sorry, um, Chris, I'm going to interrupt you. Because okay. no, well, everybody knows this. It's been said over and over again. Okay. The uh, question that David McNess yeah. 
asks uh, is about the six-week wait okay. before it, money comes through. But I think it's, don't, it's, don't bother about why it's there. Okay. Everybody's agreed. Even Labour agrees on the idea. Okay. It is just <laughs> just go to the, the, go, the, to point, the go to the six week. The point I was trying to make is that it's designed to replicate your experience in a job, receiving benefits back in a job, so you actually have a steady flow. Uh, as you move into benefits, as you move back into part-time work. Now, I don't want anyone to have no money for six weeks. And we have a system in place that money is available for advance payments for people who need it immediately if necessary. That's the right thing to do. One this is a system, wait longer than this, six weeks. This is a system that so far, it's a huge reform. It's so far been applied to 8% of benefit claimants. Um, we're rolling it out very gradually. We're learning lessons to make sure things work. When things don't work as well as they should, we're making changes. That's the right thing to do. Uh, we exactly. Hold on, wait a second. Just say that again. I'm saying to uh, Mr Graylin, the, uh, the Tory party, uh, the majority of them yesterday, they abstained in the House on the vote to, uh, to give a, a, a buffer period over the, to look into what is going wrong with this, and they abstained. That has left the people that are suffering disgusting, disgusted. So, so yesterday's vote was to pause the reform. Now, the reform is a positive. It's having a positive effect. More people are getting into work from the universal credit. No. There was the case no. from conventional benefits. No, 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 no. We're no, making no, changes no. that goes no. through. We've, we've improved the situation for advance payments. So why do we will you continue on why do making you abstain? changes why to do try you not and ensure go to that what is a like positive the reform asked you does the right thing to people. This. Hold on, I'll come back to you. Lisa and Andy, let's hear from Labour. It is just not true to say that the government is learning lessons from the rollout of this pilot. <laughs> and the reason... The reason I know that is because it was piloted first in Wigan, where I live, in 2013. And at the end of that pilot, 80% of people were in rent arrears, three times as much debt as people who hadn't been in this scheme who were also in arrears. So it is not true to say that the government is learning lessons, and it is not true to say that the government isn't aware of the scale of human misery that the chaotic rollout of this programme has already caused. And yesterday they were given an opportunity to work with us, to pause this scheme and work with us to fix it so that it could benefit people and not cause that real hardship. And not only did they refuse to do that, but they didn't even bother to turn up to defend their policy. If my constituents didn't turn up, they would be sanctioned and go without money and anything to eat for a significant amount of time. And yet that is precisely what the Tory party, who are implementing this policy, did yesterday. If there was ever a sign that this group of people is not fit to hold office in this country, this is it. Right. Yes. Lisa? The, sorry, just uh, can I, the, 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 the man there and and uh, and uh, Lisa says you failed to turn up to vote. And even the Speaker of the House of Commons, rather extraordinarily, said that the government should show respect to Parliament and say what it intends to do. Why did you abstain? Well, Why the, were you not there? The government was there. We had ministers speaking in the debate. We had backbenchers speaking in the debate. Simply choosing not to vote against a Labour Opposition Day motion, which is not a binding motion, does not mean we failed to turn up. Okay. But it, was, it, was, right. but it right. was worse. It was worse than that. There was a three-line whip for you to abstain. They were so didn't want to vote that they told people they had to abstain. And three-line whip's a bit of an arcane term that we know. But I just find that is quite extraordinary, and it just demonstrates that the government do not know what they are doing. They should have stopped. The pilots that came in, the principles were right, Simon's right. The principles about simplifying the benefits procedure was spot on. But as the pilots started, it became clear there were problems. And then worse than that, in 2015, the new Conservative government then started to make cuts to universal credit that have made things much, right. much right. worse. Right. Lisa and Andy, what do you make of what um, Simon Wilson said, that the government should borrow the money and simply pay people to get over this six-week pause? Well, that, is the, that Labour policy look, too? A, Sorry, a, I was saying, so I was saying right. that it should pay it, pay it in advance rather yes. than arrears. So the government, yes. the government says that you can get well, borrow advance... borrow to do that. Yeah, yeah. The government yeah. says that you can get advance payments, but I was sitting in my constituency office in Wigan today discussing this with my staff. We have had so many of these cases over the last few years 
and they do not tell you about the advance payments, so nobody knows. So people aren't getting what they need. They're being told that they have to wait six weeks for the money, although one in four are waiting longer because the government can't get its act together. But it's worse than that too. What we found in the pilot in Wigan is that many people didn't have bank accounts, so they needed time to get up to speed with that. Many other people weren't online and didn't have access to the internet, in part because the government has cut and cut and cut, so they don't have access to those very basic rights that they need in order to participate in the scheme. And the government says that people wait six weeks in order to get their first pay packet in work but the truth is that for people who earn the least in this country usually a, a significant minority of those people are paid weekly not six no. weekly so it is just simply not true okay i'll come to i'll come i'll come to those of you with your hands up in just a moment richard coles What's it like to be um, skint and then to go six weeks without any uh, benefit at all? Well, it's, it's grim and it's also catastrophic. I think it's grim. We see this in uh, numbers where I have people visiting the food bank, not just people actually out of work, some people in work visiting food banks, discuss. But I think the catastrophic thing is more and more people are getting into rent arrears. And what concerns me is that a six-week gap in income can create rent arrears to the extent that you face the reality of eviction. Nothing seems to me to fray the fabric of a community or to, uh, to undermine the cohesiveness of a community than insecure housing. And that's something which I think is a major, major problem. It's harder and harder to access social housing because there aren't the resources going into it. But when you get into rent arrears, then you're really, really in trouble. OK. Um, you, sir, in the front. The government has had four years of trying to get this problem sorted. Why hasn't it come up with an answer? Chris Graney. Four years of doing basically nothing. Well, we You've have still been, got major problems. We've been introducing this very quite calmly, small, a bit at a time. 8% of people now claiming the benefits. You sure, so you this is a gradual transition. Four years, so we though, learn, surely. So that we learn the lessons and we make changes, which we've been doing with advanced payments, for example, uh, making sure that people who really need money can no, get no. it on the day. That's what we've been doing to deal with what is a huge reform and try to make sure that people you don't spend six weeks without money. You shouldn't have a problem after four years of supposedly putting a, it correctly in position. So, Simon Wilson. This talk about advanced payments, does that answer your question? No, I, I, think, I think everyone, I think benefits should be paid in advance rather than in arrears. As I say, why make people who are... Who but are you say you're already well, doing that, if, are you? If, if you pay a benefit all the time in advance, when somebody gets into work and they're paid in arrears, then they have a huge gap. You're looking non plus. Well, you, if somebody comes to work for you, Simon, somebody, yeah. you pay them at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. If we're paying them at the start of the previous month, they have two months before their pay packet. No. They do? No, no, the problem actually, the, and the, I'm sure the reason it's paid in arrears, and the problem is that actually they get paid at the beginning of the month and then a week later they get a, a, a job, and so actually th they end up being overpaid. That is the but, risk of but, paying But you pay advance. people in arrears, don't you? Mm? You pay people in arrears, don't you? We do, absolutely. And, and one so of therefore the, if the state doesn't do that, it creates a problem with people moving back into work. Oh, but Chris, no, it that, completely that's just not ignores right. the human no, no, reality on. of what is happening that's to just, people. You know, the just, question was how do you survive for right. six weeks without any money, and the truth is that you beg and you borrow from family and friends if you're lucky enough to have them you are humiliated and you are hungry and at the end of it you are tired and you are angry right. and we shouldn't be doing that the, to people in this country the person over there in the third row thank you yes, yes. <laughs> person in the pale jacket yes the contempt that the tories have for the poor is just absolutely disgusting people are struggling <laughs> People are struggling as it is with all the cuts, with the social care, with NHS, with uh, working conditions, zero hour contracts. And again, the fantasy world of the Tories, it's okay. We're doing it calmly. We're doing it la di da. It's fine. Are you in favour of universal benefit in principle? In principle, it works. It is actually better. It's more cost effective. People know what they're getting. It's an introduction into work, etc. But for the Tory MPs to blatantly state that this is an incentive into work and we are helping you and then they can't even do what they're supposed to do in their job and vote. Okay. And this okay. is what is so okay, disgusting and a contempt for the poor. Yes, there was well, a sole voice on this panel on this issue. When so you talk about our attitude to people on low incomes, this is why uh, in introducing the national living wage, 
we will, across the course of this Parliament, have increased income for those the lowest level of incomes by nearly 50% because we want those it's people to earn it's a better not living. not enough on the base level that none of the Tory government seem to be on, the base level of how people are living day to day, trying to feed their children, what? trying to clothe them, trying to decide whether to get a school jumper or actually have a tooth taken out of the dentist. Oh, thought... This is the reality okay. of let life. Uh, let me take okay. one more point from the man on the front here in, red, in the red shirt. You, sir. I just want to expand on what the uh, previous speaker has said. Uh, it has, uh, uh, universal credit has uh, a very sinister uh, element to it. The sick week is not there for, uh, just by chance. It's to force people to go back, to, to, to go to work on a uh, low pay work, unsecure uh, uh, a job. So that is the reason why Chris is saying that, oh, we have a reduction on the, on the claimant because face being faced with sick weeks, without money, without uh, um, income to actually feed your family or to pay for your rent, people will take any job that they All actually right. offer to them and unless they you take the it, they, they lose all their so, benefits. Sal Brinton, on that very point, you said you were in favour of universal credit. Do you agree with him that the six weeks is designed to force people into a job? Or is that not how that, you see it? That's not how I see it and I think the, the, the reason, the principle about simplifying benefits is the right idea because before we had problems with when you're going to the council to get your housing benefits sorted or your rent paid and you were also having to talk to DWP so those are fine it's the technical way that this is working and you are right sir the, the I can remember the conservatives talking about we need a benefit that will make work pay this does not make work pay it's become infinitely worse and a lot of that is because of the timing issue um, one and a half million people are, who are with private landlords will not have housing associations or council landlords who can afford the time not to do something if they if they if rent people get into rent arrears um, and it is important that we resolve those before there's any all further right. pilots all right we must we must move on um, uh, and we've got a number of other questions to come to let's take um, can we take this question from Chris Evans please Chris Evans <coughs> Yeah, is no deal within Europe really such a big issue? Is no deal in Europe really such a big issue? Um, Lisa Nandy, um, no deal, where do you stand on it? It would be a catastrophe, it is a big issue. It's the biggest issue that this country currently faces. You know, the reality is that if we end up coming out of the EU without a deal at all, then we will see flights grounded. We'll see, despite what Chris was trying to say this week... No, no. We will see flights grounded, we will see lorries backed up at ports, we will see food prices rising, and we will face the very real prospect of a hard border with Northern Ireland. There is no question that no deal would be worse, uh, the, the worst possible deal of all. And increasingly now, I think the Cabinet is divided into two groups of people, the realists who understand this and the so fantasists who believe that no deal is a realistic prospect. The truth is there is no serious, credible Cabinet minister who currently believes that no deal is an option. And this week we had the prospect of the Brexit secretary standing at the dispatch box in the House of Commons saying no deal is a negotiating tactic. The trouble is they can hear him over in Brussels. <laughs> they know that we're bluffing and it's time we stop messing around, grandstanding and bluffing and got serious about how we are going to get the best deal out of the EU so that we can move this country right. and this economy forward. But Chris, Evans, Chris Evans' question, uh, Chris Grayling, is do the panel think, do you think, no deal in Europe is really such a bad thing? Well, I'm somebody who believes in free trade, and so therefore I think a free trade agreement with the European Union would be a good thing for us and for the European Union, and therefore my colleagues and I are going to work very hard to achieve that. What we're not going to do is adopt the Labour policy, which is say, deal at any cost. You know, what happens if they turn around and say, give us 100 billion euros uh, or no the deal? That's, that's the Labour policy. That's not policy. That's you nonsense, know. Chris. That is absolute nonsense. <laughs> and you know so, it's not so, so we are going to work hard to deliver a sensible deal. We're going to work hard to have a proper, neighbourly, friendly relationship with the European Union. But we're also going to prepare so that we're ready if that doesn't happen. So you would you I, walk away in certain circumstances? Well, Theresa May was very clear in saying no deal is better than a bad deal. We will work hard to prepare the way for a good deal with the European Union. 
but you would all expect us to also prepare for the eventuality that there is none, and we will do both. I don't expect that to happen. I don't want it to happen, but we will make sure we're ready for it if it does. All right. And we'll all be, gra all be growing more vegetables. <laughs> Uh, what we certainly won't have is planes sitting on the ground. The planes will carry on flying. The idea that Spain would stop the planes landing in the summer of 2019 an and leave it, all their hotels it's empty is just for the birds. But well, if it's for the birds, nonsense. why did the Chancellor of the Exchequer reveal it as he, a possibility? He didn't. But he actually said, I'm not going to spend lots of money on it because it's not going to happen. And it's, it, isn't. it is theoretically conceivable that in a no-deal scenario there would be no air traffic moving. Well, why did your Home Secretary say it would be unthinkable? Because we want no to secure... No deal would be unthinkable. Our goal is to secure a deal with the European Union that's good for all of us. All right. That's our goal. We're not going to admit defeat. We're not going to say we're going to fail. she said. Um, she didn't say it would be undesirable. We believe that it's she the best it thing be for Britain. And we'll work towards that, but we'll prepare for the alternative. OK. Work together so that we can get out of the EU. Yeah. Yeah. Why can't yeah. you work together? Right. Why are you uh, wasting we'll... so much time fighting with each other? OK, I'll come to you later on. Richard Coles. <laughs> Richard Coles. I think it's a very good question. It seems to be... I'm having flashbacks to the universal credit thing. So we seem to have a real problem with rollouts, don't we? Real problem <coughs> with well, the reform. This is quite a big rollout, Well, exactly, it? but... Um, <laughs> I think... I think there's something, I mean, a big problem with universal credit rolling out. We had a big problem with e-borders, a big problem with all, you know, IT projects in the BBC, in the NHS, huge one with HMRC and changes to uh, freelance status for employees, moving them to, uh, to employed status. And the biggest one of all, of course, is Brexit. My impression is sometimes that we're approaching a very uncertain, well, a cliff edge, actually. And if it is a cliff edge, I want an abseil down the cliff. I don't want to jump down the cliff. And I want to see a plan for getting... You still get there. to the bottom pretty fast. I know, but I want to get to the bottom without splatting. It would be, would well, be oh, preferred. And that's what we're aiming to give you. Well, I'd love to see a little bit more detail. But do you that, think Chris. that... I'm oh, sorry, but the question was whether no deal would be such a bad thing. Do you think no deal would be a disaster? You say you'd like to abseil down the cliff. I think I'm with Amber Rudd on that one, and I'm not very often with Amber Rudd on anything, but it seems inconceivable to me. I want to abseil. OK. Sal Brenton. The problem with the WTO rules, which is what Chris said was the way out if we have no deal, is that immediately we are legally required to slap tariffs on anything coming from the EU and vice versa. And the... Sorry? Well, 40% for lamb and beef and the Welsh uh, we Farmers Union... No, no, we are legally obliged to... Im, Im, we are absolutely... And cars, 10%, clothes, 12%, 20% for beers and spirits. And that's a problem. It's certainly a problem for both uh, countries in the EU exporting to us, but it is a major problem for us, particularly in places like Northern Ireland with the hard, soft border. Absolutely. Uh, and 90% of goods from Northern Ireland go down into the Republic of Ireland. But the Brexit here, um, beside you, disagrees with all this. No, it's, I mean, just it's just not true that we have to have those... Well, we have to have the same if tariffs we... on everyone, but that doesn't mean it has to be 40%. We may choose to say, no. actually, we're going to at, have zero tariffs on all food from all countries. What we can't do is say, Europe, if we don't have a special agreement, we can't have special arrangements for Europe. But we, it is absolutely wrong to say we have to have tariffs at but, any level. So Governments the, can set their the own tariffs. The problem is we have to set the tariffs absolutely identically across absolutely. the world, which means we also have to undo the deals that um, the government are doing, uh, beginning to talk about with other countries. There's one deal for everything. You can't pick and choose once you do these rules. I'm, I am yeah. sorry it is complicated, but you agree with that. It's got to be everything. You can't pick and choose, but that doesn't mean we have to have high tariffs. And in fact, a lot of us who voted for Brexit voted for it because actually we can become more of a free trading nation. We don't have to have these tariffs. <laughs> OK. Let me hear from some members of the audience. Uh, I, you said a man there in the one, two, three, fourth row, yes, with black hair and a jacket on, yes. Uh, no, 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 I get to the right person in the white T-shirt, yes. I, I just don't really think many people in the Labour Party or Lib Dems really understand the basics of negotiation. If you, if you go into the negotiation saying that you're not prepared for no deal, you're just signing up for a bad deal. No, you're not. <laughs> you sit, you sit, Andy. Well, look, no, 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 you're not, because we know no, that... No, look, if you shout out, we can't hear you properly because we haven't got microphones. People in here can hear you, but people, millions of people listening to you can't hear, which would be a pity. I'm sure you'd agree with that. Mm. So just wait till we get a microphone to you. Lisa? It's not an open invitation to for the EU to tell us what the deal is. It's the start of getting real 
about the fact that a no deal would be catastrophic for the EU and it would be catastrophic for us as well. And the reason why it's a completely ineffective negotiating tactic is because the government has admitted that it is only that. It is a negotiating tactic. The Home Secretary has come out and said it is unthinkable to have no deal. And That's the Prime Minister herself the has rowed back on this the rhetoric Home Secretary about... was a Remainer. She's always going to think that no deal was no option. But the fact is that the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary are quite clearly, in my view, waking up to the fact that no deal will be an absolute disaster for this country. The Brexit Secretary has admitted that it is a negotiating tactic. This is not an effective way to negotiate. I, I don't agree. I don't... All right, uh, Simon, let's just... It, 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 no, the question was, is no deal really such a bad thing? Well, no, no deal is definitely worse than having a deal. Um, as Chris said, you know, a lot of us who voted for Brexit believe in free trade. And if we don't have free trade with Europe, then um, that will be bad for our economy. I think to say that it will be a catastrophe is, is, is wrong. I think it, that's dangerous and it's an exaggeration. And I think it's very important in a negotiation that people keep a level head. And there are two, my experience of negotiating, there are two golden rules. One is you are going to have days where it just looks like the deal is impossible. And you're going to go to bed and think, you know, this, there's just no way this is going to happen. And everyone sleeps on it, they think about it, and they're testing each other's positions. And you go back the next day, and sure enough, the deal proceeds. So I, I, don't th I, don't, I think we've got to be very careful not to have a national meltdown every time we hit an impasse, because it's going to happen. People will sleep on it and we'll, we'll go through it. So, are you, so sorry, are you, are, you, are you confident in the way that the negotiations are being handled by the government? I think it's very difficult to judge from outside. And I think, I think actually trying to negotiate in public, it makes it particularly difficult. It makes it harder for both sides to compromise. So I think we've got to be careful about making judgments about uh, conversations that are happening that we're not party to. But what about the, the things the, that are said publicly? I mean, you're a Conservative. When you look at the way that the Cabinet says different things Lisa was referring to, does that disconcert you? Or can no, you understand it's, it's, that? Or is that reasonable? No, it, actually, you know what? Having a debate between uh, a, a, an optimistic and enthusiastic Boris Johnson and a cautious and conservative um, Philip Hammond, having that debate in public is not a bad thing. And finding the middle ground between them is actually a very sensible way to proceed. The idea that we all have to, as a nation, have one idea and never have any differences means that we won't get the best deal. We've got to talk about these things. But the second thing I want to say is that if we don't have, if we don't have a credible plan to walk away with, then we're not going into a negotiation. We are going in to ask the price. And we can only bluff, plead and beg. We have to have a plan have for to. no deal scenario because if we don't, we are not going to get the best deal. All right. The person in the very back there. Yeah. Yes, yes. Man at the back in blue. Mr Grayling, if you genuinely have a plan B for how things would work under WTO rules, why don't you publish it and show the EU that you're serious and convince us that you have the detail? Well, the answer to that is that we are actively working on that plan. I'm doing so in my own area. Uh, we will bring forward details when we need to, but we're not approaching this on the basis that we're going to need to do that. Right now, we're working to try and secure the best deal for Britain. Yes, of course, we're making contingency plans, and we'll be very clear, I'm saying so tonight, but very clear, I'm looking at the whole issue of transportation, the ports, to make sure we are ready for that. But I'm an optimist. I expect us to do a deal. I expect this to be something that works for both sides. We are the European Union's biggest export market. It would be, I think, hugely damaging to businesses in France, in Belgium and the Netherlands if there was not a free trade deal. And that's why I'm absolutely certain that there will be. But you would expect us to be doing the work which we are doing now, and we'll be talking more about it in due course, to make sure that there is an alternative route in the unlikely event that we have to take it. All right. The woman here in the front. Yeah. What I'm seeing outside looking in, it looks like the Tories can't even manage their own party. So how can we possibly trust you to take us into Brexit with a good deal? Well, you... <laughs> so I think you know, Simon's point is right. We're not a group of clones sitting around the Cabinet table. We have discussions, we have debates, we have differences of opinion. We reach a common position. Theresa May's speech in Florence uh, a couple of weeks ago was very much... Uh, a result of a united cabinet discussion. Uh, she spoke for all of us, uh, and you know, she has set out the path we're taking. That's the way we should be doing things. Chris, how much time have we got? One thing that concerns me is we're talking about very detailed work, and we don't have much time to do it. I was talking to an official the other day 
who has been seconded to uh, the Department for Brexit. And she was saying that the issue they're finding is they have 10 years' work to do in less than two years. And that the kind of things you're talking about sound like luxuries if you're working to a timescale that's that ungenerous. Well, all I can say within the Department of Transport, we're not trying to do 10 years' work in two years. What we're working to do is perfectly attainable, perfectly achievable. I hope it's never necessary. Right. I'll take a couple more points. The man there in the brown jacket. Yes. Yeah, the speaker on the front row just said she can't trust the Conservative Party. I can't trust Lisa and the Labour Party and Baroness Brinton and the Lib Dems because all they want to do is connive a situation to create a second referendum. Yeah. What you've got to do, what you've got to do is honour what the people have already said. 1.4 million people want to leave the EU. That's what we've got to get on with and do. And do you think it's straightforward or do you think it's a difficult task that the government faces? Of course it's difficult. It's a very complicated issue. But you can only negotiate with people if they want to negotiate. How long do we have to give the EU? How long do we have to give Mr Juncker to, to start saying things that are reasonable? All I can see is unreasonable comments from the EU. They're not taken as seriously. If I was the PM, I would give them a week's notice and I would leave the following day. OK. I'll take, I'll take one more point, then we, we, must, we must go on. Yes, the woman in pink there, yes. You. Ever since the whole no deal... No, sorry, I don't know. We're getting very confused in the studio. It's too difficult to see people. Hold on. Yes, the woman up there. That's it. Um, we, we've had our vote. Uh, we've had the referendum. I don't believe we should have a second referendum. I think, I, I think the Labour and the Liberal Party are pushing, and some, some dare I say, Conservatives are pushing for a second We're referendum. Not. Let's We're get not. on with it. Let's get behind... It's a very, very difficult thing, probably one of the most difficult things we've asked the government to do. Um, but it could be very exciting. I believe it could be very exciting for this country. And, and I'm, I'm appealing to the Labour and the Liberal Democrat. I'm actually a Liberal Democrat at heart. And I'm appealing to you to get behind the government, to work together, to work together yes. for the good of this country, All not right. to keep bickering All right. with everyone Stop. All right, between. we've heard your point, madam. Stop bickering. Uh, Lisa, just to answer that, would you? I, I, just, I just want to say to you that if, if we were trying to uh, have a second referendum or somehow stop us from leaving the European Union, then we wouldn't have voted to trigger Article 50. I voted to trigger Article 50 despite the fact that I went out and campaigned for Remain. We lost the referendum, and now our job, in my view, is to get the best deal for this country. But I will not apologise for saying to people like Chris that still now... After six months, after triggering Article 50 with a clock ticking, we should not be messing around saying we've got this great negotiating position, no deal, it's not going to happen, but don't worry because Brussels hasn't worked it out. It's just not good enough. Right. We need to get serious. OK, um, I'm, the hand's up. I can't bring you all in. I'm really sorry. Uh, we have this debate, as you know, week after week after week, mm. uh, where we go around the country and hear what people think with different views as the negotiations go on, and we'll no doubt come back to it. But... Uh, I, I want to keep a variety of questions in question time. We've got a question from Linda Forbes that I'd like to take, please. Lin Linda Forbes. As, as an obese taxpayer... As should, a what, sorry? As an obese taxpayer, should I be less deserving of NHS treatment than people who take other risks with their health? A very, very interesting question. As an obese taxpayer, and this is in the light of... It was an NHS uh, restatement, I think, just near, uh, an authority just near here, that not only if you were technically obese, but if you were a smoker, you could be breathalyzed to see if you'd stop smoking before you got medical treatment. Um, Richard Coles, what do you make of that? Um, well, as someone, when I had my medical for Strictly, I discovered I was 0.4 short of obese myself, which came as rather a shock. I'm happy to say that my Paso Doble saw me lose a stone, probably <laughs> through fear more than anything else. Um, <clears throat> But I don't think the NHS should be rolling that one out. Um, I, I, I'm horrified at the thought that people uh, who are classified as obese might have to be further back in the queue for NHS provision. I understand, of course, that provision has always got to be... Uh, you know, those things aren't limitless. But I do think it's fundamentally important. It's a fundamental principle of the NHS. It's a fundamental principle of living in a civilised society, that we all have an inalienable and ineradicable status that comes simply from being human beings and that there's no uh, priority in that at all. So I would hate to see healthcare uh, meted out in that kind of way. Linda Forbes, have you had a, a direct experience or been warned about this in, in terms of operations or any medical treatment? Uh, no, but I have lost over six stones in the last year. And... 
<laughs> this is this question time is not a slimmer's club. <laughs> <laughs> but we want and, to know and the secret. Read, and have um, worked with other people through NHS Health Unlocked and realised just how difficult it is to lose weight. And actually, for some people who are very overweight, that getting access to operations that will enable them to exercise again yeah. is being restricted, which actually ties them into even more ill health. OK, Sal Brinton. Well, I think that that's the absolute conundrum. If help was offered at the start, um, and there was a sort of a line and you could see very clearly, but I, I know from other people who've been told either they've got to stop smoking or they've got to lose weight before they'll even go onto the waiting list, uh, it really doesn't help and it can cause some very serious problems. Is it moral to do that? No, I, d I don't believe it is. I think Richard was right. The NHS is there for everyone. We pay our taxes. It's part of the safety net of our society. It's the one thing that the vast majority of people in this country feel we should stick with. I know the Americans don't understand it and, and often complain uh, on our behalf about our NHS, but actually at the end of the day, it's wonderful. Part of its problem at the moment, and one of my worries about some of these rules that seem to be being created, are that the NHS is really struggling for cash. So IVF is often being removed. Uh, and I know in my hometown of Watford, we have just had a major fight trying to keep a respite centre for the most severely disabled and ill children open because there just aren't the funds to do it. And my real worry would be, I accept the, the, the health principle, but actually if it then becomes a delaying tactic can be used mm. to, to not go ahead with operations, that's worrying. Chris, we we uh, must fund the NHS properly. Yes, yeah, but Chris, this is about uh, particular um, candidates for treatment. Chris Grayling, what do you think of what... The question of Linda Forbes. I, I, I struggle with the idea that somebody would be denied treatment. Uh, I really do. I think uh, to say to somebody who smoked, to say somebody who is obese, you may not have treatment. I, I really struggle with that idea. Uh, I think perhaps the only circumstance in which it becomes uh, uh, more of an issue is if somebody is systematically reviews, refusing to do something that the doctors again and again are advising them to do. Uh, but to say to somebody who walks through the door, because you smoked, you may not have an operation, because you're obese, you may not have an operation. Of course, the challenge the health service faces is that demand on it is growing all the time. We have an ageing population, more and more people seeking treatment. The number of people going into A&E departments every year is rising up and up and up. But that should not be a reason for us to deny people the, treatment. The, 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 the National Health Service is a national health service. Is the NHS in Hertfordshire, for instance, which is doing this, entitled legally to say what they've said? Well, actually, the National Health Service, in reality, um, has always operated to a degree on a local level. Decisions are taken locally, decisions are taken by local clinicians locally, and that's probably for the best, because circumstances do vary in different parts of the country. So even though you don't um, like it, you can't, as a government, have any control over it? We can't step in, but I would hope that those people... And, and the local decisions about commissioning services are now taken by organisations that are led by clinicians. Okay. Um, I would still hope those people would take, back and, uh, take a step back and not actually say to somebody, you won't get treatment. All right. Uh, I'll come to the, you there, the woman there with spectacles, and then I'll come to you over there. Yes, quickly, if you would. Um, Chris Grayling, to say that you struggle with, what, with somebody being turned away from the health service and these are local decisions to be made, Hertfordshire CCG, which is the one you're referring to, and where I live in Hertfordshire, are faced with having to make more and more cuts. So if you're asking them to make £55 million more of cuts than they already have, then you are responsible, not the local clinicians and so You are responsible as the government for asking them to make cuts and for turning people away for basic treatment now. But what do you say to the argument that they're entitled to ration, in effect, their health care on the grounds of obesity and smoking. That's well, the issue I th that was raised. Well, I think that, that I agree with uh, Reverend Richard Coles. The health service, is the, it's the jewel of the crown of this country. It's something that everybody should be proud of and should have equal access to. The trouble with the society we're living in in the moment is becoming more and more unequal, and this is a prime example of that inequality. All right. Simon Wolfson, I'll come to you in a minute. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually a really difficult question. To what extent uh, are we responsible for our, our own health? And um, you know, I was sitting there thinking about, thinking about the answer to this as everyone was talking, and what I, I thought, I put myself in the position of the person who, who would have to tell someone that actually, I'm really sorry, you can't have this treatment because 
you are overweight. And I thought, would I ever want to be in that situation? And, you know, not in a million years. Should we put other people in that situation? Of course we shouldn't. OK. And the man there with spectacles, and then I come to you, Lisa. Lisa. Um, yeah, we, we, yeah. Um, we often talk when it, when, in terms of substance abuse, for example, like heroin abuse that, and addiction, that, that these um, people are victims of their own addiction. Um, and it could be said similarly that smokers are victims of their own addiction. And it's only a small step then to say that people who are overweight are victims of their own addiction to food. But surely it comes down to a certain extent to personal responsibility. And people surely have to be seen in some ways to be helping themselves to help the NHS to help them. All right. And the woman in pink there. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Um, I think it's discrimination. I mean, how can you deny one person one thing in, in one area and another person of uh, equal situation be allowed that same treatment in another area? But also it's double standards. You're denying somebody treatment for consuming food or cigarettes that they are paying taxes on. Doesn't make any sense to me. Lisa Nandy. Um, Actually, I agree with what Simon said. There are a group of people in this country who do face restrictions on their health care, and that's asylum seekers. And actually, as well as being very immoral, in my view, and creating some absolutely terrible results, the impact of those regulations has been to really damage the relationship between doctor and patient. Because if you are the person who is rationing health care, you cannot then claim to be the person who first does no harm and who is primarily responsible for their care. Before I came into Parliament, I used to work with homeless young people. And I absolutely agree with the sentiment that we all have a responsibility to try and take personal responsibility for our own uh, health care and for keeping ourselves well and fit and healthy. But many of those young people would end up with drug and alcohol problems that they were then treated for. And it would then become very, very apparent that the drug and alcohol abuse was simply a way of self-medicating because of underlying mental health problems that hadn't been previously diagnosed. And so my worry is that if we even begin to start discussing taking this approach more generally in the National Health Service, we will go down a very, very slippery slope that will stop people getting the help that they and, need when they so need it. I think we also we all have our addictions, don't we? There are the obvious ones there, but if it's, we're all addicted to driving our cars, aren't we? With the consequences for health of emissions and also simply through uh, people getting into to accidents. That's something that the health service picks up mm -hmm. without question, but, you know, we needn't do that. The, the man there at the very back, and then we'll take last questions. We've got five minutes left, I think. Yes, yes there's, um, there's lots of talk about the morality of, of uh, rationing health care, but what about the morality of taking money out of people's pockets to pay for other people's poor lifestyle choices that are completely their choice? And OK. All right, and since you've got your hand up, I'll come to you, sir, in the front row here. Um, as the um, cigarettes and obesity, why don't the government ban cigarettes and try to close up fast food stores so that people don't have the things that make them obese. OK. Well, there's a prescription. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is it because you get too much money out of tax for well, cigarettes? I think it's, banning things is a big step. Um, banning fast food, I think, um, would be pretty unpopular in an awful lot of places in this country, actually. <laughs> All right. Yeah, OK. Let's, uh, we've got four or five minutes left. I'd like to take this question from Patricia Broderick, please. Are schools overstepping the mark when they send home alarm clocks with their pupils? <laughs> yes, just as a mysterious question maybe to some of you. It is just one school, it has to be said, but it does go to the heart of a particular problem. A school in Twickenham in London which decided to set, give alarm clocks to its children, or allegedly so, so that instead of using their iPhones uh, to wake them up in the morning, they had a proper alarm clock and turned their iPhones off. And it goes to the heart of this whole business about children, young people and middle-aged people and no doubt people around this table being addicted to the iPhone. Richard Coles, are you addicted to your iPhone and do you use an alarm clock in the morning? And maybe uh, you should if you don't. Well, uh, I rise with the lark anyway, with a song in my heart. <laughs> 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 but uh, I am, I, I would hesitate to say I'm addicted to my, to my mobile, but um, I do have a very active life on social media, which I have mixed feelings about. Uh, partly, I think... Just, I was in a restaurant the other day and there were two people sitting on the next table who were 
having dinner together but spend the whole time on their phones which seemed to me to be not the ideal way to treat your dinner date mm -hmm. but on the other hand it is a place where people meet one of the things i love about social media it's a place where you really can encounter a whole broad range of people and some of those encounters though glancing though brief can be extremely rewarding and lead on to other sorts of exciting things so and also if you want to get a kid off an iphone or an ipad or whatever it may be Good luck with that. Uh, I'm a school governor, and it's a perpetual uh, question that comes up on our agenda. And it's an extremely difficult thing. To Have do. you thought about issuing alarm clocks to your children at school? No, I haven't. Hasn't come out. Put That's it on the agenda. The Simon Wolfson. Um, funnily enough, I, I, for religious reasons, I turn my phone off on a Friday night, sundown, and I keep it off until Saturday nightfall. And I've got to say, that is an incredibly liberating thing to do. Um, so I don't know where the school. This is stuff. religious yeah, reasons. Yeah, that's right. Yes. It's the Jewish Sabbath. So um, I, I, it is a very liberating thing to do. And what you realise is that actually, it's not a life support machine, and you can live for 24 hours without your phone. And uh, I think every so often people should. Someone is saying I, they can't. I would, <laughs> I would recommend trying it. Just try it one weekend. Just turn your phone off for 24 hours and see what happens. You'll have a much nicer weekend. Listen, Anne, did you see this as a real, a serious problem with? Serious problem with with young people, um, and indeed perhaps yourself. And um, I was going to say, good luck getting politicians off their iPhones. <laughs> Maybe if we all turn them off for 24 hours, we might get together and solve the problems with Brexit. Um, <laughs> I I, um, I think that there is a danger in this debate that, for all of the you know many well rehearsed reasons why it's a good idea to make sure that young people are out in the real world and meeting people who think differently from them and not in the bubble of social media where we tend to seek out people who've got the same opinions as us that are self-reinforcing. All of those things are well rehearsed and I think they're true. But we shouldn't forget as well that technology has been an enormous force for good for children and young people. The charity Childline says that one of the reasons that they have seen a rise in the number of young people coming to them for help about child abuse is because in the, when I was growing up you had to pick up a phone, you probably had to go to a phone, find a phone box and ring them. Now, young people can email, they can contact through Facebook, they can contact through WhatsApp. There are so many ways for them to do it that actually for those young people who need a lifeline, they found that having an iPhone or access to technology has been it. So I think we should be really, really careful here not to say that it's just a force for bad, because for many of those young people, it's been an absolute lifeline. Okay, very briefly, you sir, over there on the right, yes. Yeah. With, with technology, it's become, an it's become an integral part of our, of our lives, as, especially as young people, I'm only 17, but like, it's, be it's becoming a societal thing, like the invention of the Gutenberg Press and the, and the popularization of the books. It's helping us spread ideas, it's helping us become more connected as a wider world, which is what we need in these trying times. Technological addiction is a very common thing, like in the 1700s there were mass book readings and book reading was a sociable thing. We, and we will move past it with the next invention. It's just a natural reoccurring cycle within human nature and history. OK, thank you very much. Um, Chris Grayling, briefly if you would, because we'll need an alarm clock now because we're well, running out of time. I suspect in a lot of cases that neither an alarm clock nor a mobile phone will wake up uh, many teenagers. <laughs> um, but the reality is um, social media, mobile phones are a force for good. They can also be a force for bad. There's some real issues in social media that I think as a society we have to address. So, Brendan? And therefore, the key is to make sure that families discuss amongst themselves about how young people use their mobile phones and when they use them. And that's the most important thing. Um, I'm co-chair of the all-party group on bullying and cyberbullying late at night on iPhones in bedrooms is a real problem. OK, thank you very much indeed. So... Our, 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 our really is up. Um.